Hello and welcome to our weekly shear on the Parsha. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Vayeshev. And as usual, the shear is dedicated for some special individuals. First of all, Rachai, sorry, Rafal Chai, not Rachai, uh, as a such a name is Rachai, in somebody's language. Rafal Chai Ben Sora. Rafal Chai Ben Sora, we've been happening for, for a very long time. He is extremely dear to me. I like this young man very much. He's got a young family. He's not been well for quite a long time, and he's in hospital at the moment having a blood transfusion. So Rafal Chai should have a, a Rafal Shlema. So too should Orea Chaim Ben Chana Yehudis. He's the little boy who's waiting for the lung transplant. Ita Rivka Bas Sima Esther, my dear, wonderful wife, who is uh, recovering from her second complete knee replacement operation. And a cousin of mine in Eretz Yisrael, uh, Yechesko Yehuda Ben Yenta, um, who's uh, recovering also from very uh, major surgery. They should all have a refer shalema. As usual, if you'd like to dedicate the shear uh, for somebody's recovery, uh, somebody's remembering, uh, or to remember somebody, I should say, uh, to celebrate some simcha, then please just get in touch with me at yy at askrabbiyy.com and we'll do that very thing for you. Um, people ask how much is it to sponsor the shear? It's $180. Not so bad. Right. This week's Parsha. Well, actually, this week's Parsha, a little bit. I think we're going to talk about Hanukkah and we're going to talk about miracles. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the whole story of Hanukkah is a story of miracles. I think I'd like to start off by pointing out the Ramban, as I've I mentioned this many times, it's one of the most fundamental things of all. The Ramban says at the end of Parsha's boy, but of course, boy, now we're coming to the, I mean, the. Uh, part of the Torah which is full of miracles is, of course, the exodus from Egypt. He saves the shrine. And at the end of Parsha's boy, the Ramban points out that so many of the mitzvahs that we do are predicated on a formula of words, Zechel Etzias Mitzrayim. This mitzvah is Zechel Etzias Mitzrayim to recall the exodus from Egypt. This mitzvah is for, to recall the exodus from Egypt. Why so much emphasis on that? And he says, because Hashem doesn't do miracles of that scale, of that grandeur, epic miracles, like those of the Exodus all the time, then we want to recall the fact that he did do them. And we do that through the little miracles, or rather the big miracles that we remember that Hashem did, points to the little miracles that happened to us all the time. And those are the fundamentals. This is the foundation of the entire Torah. That's a big statement. But the big miracles in Egypt point to the small miracles that are our daily companions. Uh, we say that in the Moedim prayer. Uh, and the miracles that are with us all the time. And remember, we are the series of Shirem is on Taras Kelm. So the founder of Shem, Kelm was Yeshiva, of the Kelm Yeshiva was Reb Simcha Zissel, who points out that he'd been saying all his life Al Hanisim, the extra prayer that we add to the Shemona Esra, uh, and not notice what the word said, and then suddenly it strikes him. That's a phenomenon I'm sure you're familiar with. It happened to me just the other week when I noticed something I've been saying for uh, a long time uh, without noticing what the words meant. The thing that got Arab Sim, because this was very excited, it says, Al Hanisim, Al Purkim, Al Gvuras, Al Maturas, Al Machamash, Al Sisa, Al all the miracles and all the incredible things that Hashem did for Al Vasena, Bayama Mahim, Bazman Azeh. In those days, at this time, and he said, I always thought that it referred to the um, Yomi Mahim in those in those days at that historical point in time. At this time, with the calendar, he said, No, it doesn't mean that. It says Yomi Mahim. In uh, in those days, he did miracles as a man as a, uh, and in this time too. So miracles is really the theme, of course, um, of 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 uh, of Hanukkah, obviously. Um, so let's just consider how miracles and what miracles are all about. Uh, and, uh, well, not all about, but let's, let's at least introduce ourselves to the concept of miracles. And we'll do it through the words of the Rambam. And then in this week's year, um, of course, it's meant to be Taras Kelm. Kelm, of course, Reb Simcha Zissel, as I mentioned before, his greatest Talmud, I think it would be fair to say, Reb Yeruchim, We've talked about him a lot in the last few weeks. We went on to, and passed away, remember, only in 1936. I went on to be the, he was the Meshkiach in Radin, the Chobetz Chaim's yeshiva, very close to the Chobetz Chaim, and then went on to become the, the great um, Meshkiach of Mir. Uh, 
Um, but his Talmudim and Mir, my Rosh Hashiva, Blake Gurubitz, and so many others, uh, if I remember correctly, um, and one in particular whom I'm going to visit tonight, is a Rechaim Shmulevitz, the Rosh Hashiva Mir, and his wonderful Sikhs Musa. Now, he's not a direct Talmud of Kelm, except that Kelm, the revolution of Kelm, of course, leads to an evolution from Kelm if that makes sense, the revolution of Kelm, its unique revolutionary approach to Musa, a uh, very intellectual Musa, evolved into, well, the Meshkiach of Mir, um, Rav Yerucham, and of course his scores, hundreds of Talmidim, and throughout the generations. So that's where we're going tonight. Um, we're going to be looking at something in, in Sikhs Musa of Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, and then I've got a story to tell you. Um, it's a story which I think is appropriate to tell at this time of year, and particularly because uh, the story has come back into the news just in the last few days. It's a story of, I think I would say, the biggest miracle I have, I've known, I know about, certainly in my lifetime, and I was actually part of, I played a part in, which I'd like to share with you. Anyway, what does the Rambam have to say about miracles? So this is what the Rambam says. The Rambam says, and this is in the uh, the eighth peric of Yisodi Hatara, and he says, Moshe Rabbeinu lo hamina bo Yisrael ba mnei ta'a also. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Jewish people, oh, said that too quickly, Moshe Rabbeinu, the Jewish people did not believe in him because of the miracles that he did. Shalmami no piha oisus, he goes on to say that anybody who believes in Moshe, or anyone who wants to believe in Moshe because of the miracles that he did, yish belibo doifi. Uh, a nice translation might be, he has got foolishness in his heart. It's stupid, I suppose. Why? Because um, because maybe he did those miracles using black magic, um, using occult power. I mean, after all, when Moshe Rabbeinu is dispatched by Hashem to tell Paro to let the Jewish people go, he's told to perform miracles in front of Paro, throws down the stick, it turns into a snake. Paro turns to his magicians who replicate the miracle. Then the al says he turned to his wife, she threw down her stick and turned into a snake. Then he turned to the teenage boys in the palace who are watching the whole uh, confrontation and told them to turn their sticks into snakes, and they could. And then he brought the children from the kindergarten, who also could. In other words, Mitzrayim, Egypt, at that time, was a society completely built on occult power. And of course, that's where Moshe had his, ed his education, his background. So that even though Chazal tell us, even though the rabbis tell us, that they, they were only able to replicate the first couple of miracles that Moshe Rabbeinu did, dance or day, etc. Um, and after that, their powers were exhausted. But you could simply make a very reasonable argument that Moshe was simply better at their stuff than they were. So as the Rambam says, and clearly uh, that would prove nothing. Um, so therefore he says, oh, and he goes on to point out that all the miracles that Moshe did in the desert were in order to provide a need that because the Jewish people were in trouble. They had no water, then there's the miracle of hitting the rock. Remember, this happens twice. Um, originally to bring them water, no food, man, etc., etc. Not as a proof to his miracle, uh, to, his, to his status as Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest prophet who ever lived. So then, missing out a little bit, he then says, So when did they believe in Moshe Rabbeinu? If a miracle proves nothing. So when did they believe in Moshe? So he says the following thing. The answer is, when we stood at Mount Sinai, we saw with our own eyes, we heard with our own ears, the thunder, the lightning, the uh, the darkness. And the voice saying to Moshe, go and tell him this halacha, that halacha, etc. Now, as I may have said in previous sharing, the obvious problem with the Rambam is that if the Rambam is telling us that we have to have a, an, a, a healthy degree of skepticism with regards to Moshe's miracles to the point where we're not convinced by the miracles he did in Mitzrayim because maybe those miracles were occult magic, then why can't I extend that cynicism that I'm licensed to possess uh, skepticism a stage further and say, so Moshe goes up to the mountain. In fact, when Moshe goes up to the mountain and into the darkness and we hear a voice speaking to him, 
If I'm allowed to be so cynical, I could be cynical. I could be well cynical about that one. I do not know how you turn water into blood. I don't know how you make hail come uh, so that ice and fire is happening simultaneously. And all the rest of our selective, selective plagues that affect only the firstborn. I don't know how you could imagine doing such things. But I certainly imagine how you can imagine a voice how you could imagine a voice speaking to somebody in Mount Sinai as the, the person speaking to himself. Moshe, tell them this. Deep voice moves to the side. Okay, Hashem, I'll do that. Moshe's voice. Um, if I'm allowed to be so cynical, why can't I be skeptical about that either? So the Rambam says that the, and here's the hint, um, that when we see, when we heard, we saw the coilus, we saw the sounds. Now, what you're doing now is hearing my voice being recorded, obviously. Um, but you're hearing my voice, which is air passing over my larynx, which is a muscle expanding and contracting to cause the airways to change their shape, uh, which creates the, the, the noise, the sound, the tone of the, of the words that I'm forming, and it's able to be translated in your mind so you understand exactly what I'm saying to you. How do you see a sound? Leaving aside an oscilloscope, how do you see a sound? And the answer is, in the laws of physics, the laws of our world, you don't see a sound. You see a sight. You hear a sound. But we're talking about something which is out with sound, eh, the laws of sound in our world. In other words, when they stood at Mount Sinai, the Jewish people became prophets. Now, suppose I was to say to you, leaving aside tech, um, uh, using Google or any search engine online, who is the greatest cardiac surgeon in the United States today? And you're not allowed to Google. How would you find out? Well, it'd be a good idea to start by asking doctors, particularly heart surgeons. And they would be able to tell you who the top two or three are. You'd have to factor in, of course, professional jealousy, etc. But you get it down to two or three. Who's the greatest oncologist? Again, same process. The greatest violinist. The greatest composer. Class, um, orchestral com uh, composer. Who's the greatest prophet? Same process. Ask prophets. When the Jewish people reach the level of prophecy, then the Jewish people are able to attest themselves that this is the real deal. Because they themselves are prophets. Then they know. Anything else, any miracle, could prove nothing. Except that Moshe Rabbeinu had incredible occult power. But when we see and we are prophets ourselves, we're able to realize that this is, we are able to distinguish the real from the fake the fraudulent from the, the, the authentic. Now that we've established Moshe Rabbeinu's authenticity, well, then the halacha goes on to say, with that in mind, um, the, that, uh, I'll jump over the page to halacha gimel, now once the next halacha goes on to say the same thing, once we've established Moshe Rabbeinu's um, bona fides, his validity, and then by definition, he sets out the, the rules for what is the authentic prophetic experience. So even though prophecy, uh, sorry, miracle, miraculous phenomenon in themselves prove nothing, but once Moshe Rabbeinu, whom we have proven, says that if somebody, a prophet, does this in such a certain way, according to the, the rules that I'm going to set out, then you take it seriously, then you can pay attention to it. One of those rules would be the fact that the Chazal recognize it as being a miracle. For example, the Hanukkah story. So let's visit the Hanukkah story, and this will take us exactly, as I said to you, to Sikhus Musa of Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, and we'll also visit um, a theme from this week's Parsha as well, in Parsha Zayeshev. It's very beautiful, incidentally. The, the style, as I said to you, the, the revolution of Kelm, as I mentioned, very intellectual, very intellectual, uh, leads to the, uh, leads to the evolution of the same Musa school, um, but the the style of uh, Sikhus Musa Rokhan Shmulevitz, who incidentally, as I said, Rosh Yivam, Rosh Yivam Mir said that he was so surprised that he became, as it were, well known, renowned, famous. Although he would never have used the word famous about himself, um, not for his Gemara Shirim, but his his drushes on the Parshas. Uh, so you see much of the the, the, the Musa of Kelm and of Rabbi Rucham in it. But it's a different style. It's, uh, if I could say this gentler, not in any way less profound, but not as demanding of you that uh, from, from the, the very outset that this is a, a huge intellectual challenge 
that you're about to experience or about to um, be drawn into. He writes very gently, but very, very beautifully. And, and he talks about the nays of Hanukkah. Now, of course, what is the nays of Hanukkah? Hmm. Well, if I ask you that, uh, I'm sure you would say, as I would, of course, I prepared this, so I saw what he says, so I know what the answer is going to be. But of course, the nascent Hanukkah is the Hanukkah, the fact that the light's lit. This is the question the Gemara asks. My Hanukkah, what's all about? Gemara and Shabbos. My Hanukkah, well, is a nascent And Rashi says, what, what's the Gemara asking? It says, what's Hanukkah? On what miracle was the festival built? What does the miracle, does the festival address? Celebrate. So he says the following thing. So this is the Gemara. Just, the Tana Rabbana, the Rabbana learned and understood the following. When the Greeks took control of the temple and contaminated it, defiled it, and defiled all the oil which was specially produced and was sealed with the seal of the coming goddle to attest to its, its uh, purity, its spiritual purity as part from its physical purity, and then, after the whole story uh, of the Hanukkah story uh, occurs, and the Hashmanaim uh, banish, and the Jews uh, banish the, the Greeks, uh, then they search for They only find one little crew, one little clay pot of, of oil that had survived in, intact with its integrity and its purity and its kashras intact. with the stamp of the There was only enough for the menorah to uh, be lit for one uh, day. And of course, we know what comes next. So it was able, they were able to use it. Either they poured in, in uh, a small amount and it burnt, and they were able to pour in another small amount and it burnt for the day to, to extend to eight days. Um, or they poured in, poured it all in according to another opinion, and it lasted for eight days in all, so seven, one day naturally, and seven days of complete miracle. And as a consequence, for the rabbis ordained that there would be for all other throughout the centuries, throughout the years, uh, there would be a yom tov, a celebration. Um, uh, with Hallel, the saying of Hallel, and of gratitude to, to God for what he did in this miracle. And then says, and from that statement of the Talmud, so it seems to be the question is that, that, that we started with what is that about what mer- miracle does Hanukkah celebrate? The finding and the miracle that came about through the oil burning for eight days. Fine. Then, he says, but let's consider that. At that time, the very existence of the Jewish people was under threat. It was not a physical extermination as it would be at the Purim time, of course, in last century, in my lifetime, and many, probably many people listening to this or watching this in your lifetime as well, when the Nazis tried to eradicate us, it was a spiritual eradication, and one which was extraordinarily successful and nearly succeeded. The commercial must came Balanisim, as we say in Balanisim, and Balanisim, on the Malchus Yobin of Russia, when the evil kingdom of, of Greece rose up against the Jewish people, to eradicate and make, make forgotten your Torah, so the Jewish people no, no, no longer behaved as you wanted them to behave, and you did big miracles for them. Mighty soldiers were destroyed by weak um, uh, Jewish men who were not skilled in warfare. Rabin Biyad Ma'atim, a mighty army, was defeated by a much smaller army. And recording all the incredible uh, miracles that happened uh, in the war. So now Anisim, it seems to say, it was because of the miraculous defeat of a mighty Greek army by a very small guerrilla army of the Jewish people. 
not mentioning, of course, the, the lighting of the for of eight days through that one little container of oil. So he says this quite strongly. Could you con contrast and compare? Would it be a reasonable thing to compare and to contrast the, the, the miracle, the event of that oil burning um, for seven days, Linnaeus had solace to the, the miracle of the defeat of this army, which saved, saved the entire Jewish people, saved the Torah, the answer is obviously not. So therefore, which is it? What miracle are we talking about? So Rechem Shalevitz then takes us to our Parsha. In our Parsha, of course, after um, there is the selling of Yosef, well, they attempt to kill Yosef with the brothers, and then with the intervention of Reuben, eventually Yehuda, um, then he's going to be sold instead. Um, when that happens, this is what it's, what the 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 pasuk says. Hini arches yishma elim bom migilad v'gam lehem noisim nechavatzari v'lod v'holkim v'hayod v'mitzrayim. So as the pasuk says, sorry, my voice is going. Uh, there was a caravan of yishma elim of Arabs coming uh, for a place called Gilad, and they were going to be taking going down to and uh, going down to Egypt. Fine, so that's easy stuff. V'amr chazal halo in darchem, and what were they carrying? What were they carrying? Um, so they were carrying various spices, carrying spices. And Rashi says, But that's strange, because rather like the world today, if you think of OPEC, the Arabs had a monopoly on oil or petroleum. And that's what this is. So they had, they had uh, something called Vatron, and and neft, another opinion says it's, it is animal skins that we're carrying. Neft, of course, is petroleum, um, and it's smelly stuff. Of course, petrol, gasoline is smelly stuff, and atron is apparently um, something you, you can burn in place of oil. I'm not sure what it is. They say it's some sort of resin, but it apparently gave off a very nasty smell when it, before it was burnt and and uh, after it was burnt. So I'm not sure what it is. So therefore they were um, they normally, because they had this monopoly in the, on the petrol market, the petroleum market, that's what they would carry. That's what they'd be bringing down to Egypt. But apparently they weren't. They were bringing down oil. Uh, sorry, uh, spices. And why? And in they're bringing all the such. Uh, in order that when Yosef's being carried down instead of in this horrible, smelly place, or, a, or I'm assuming some sort of cell type thing. Uh, he was being pulled behind uh, an old uh, some sort of wagon. Um, but uh, instead of it being a smelly environment, smelly camp, it was a very fragrant one. Wow. So that's the miracle that Hashem did for Yosef. To which, as it were, um, uh, professional note says, Really? What sort of miracle is that? Uh, I'll read to you the, to the Hebrew because it's uh, it's quite dramatic the way he says it. I like it. He says, At the time, a, a terrible time, a difficult time, like this, that Yosef is going down to Mitzrayim. When he falls from his previous position, Ben Zakunim Shal Yaakov Avinu, somebody who was close to the great Sadik, his father, Yaakov Avinu, who could uh, learn with his father all day long. Um, uh, who could pass on to him all the Torah, all the prophecy that he got from the Shiva of Shem and Ever, the Bira make to the to the most profound depths. And now he's become a, a, a slave, an Egyptian slave. He's now transferred to a place which is the reached almost the pen the, the, the penultimate, almost the ultimate level of, of moral degradation. A, a place where he's going to be a slave, a place where he's never going to get out, uh, where his life is effectively over. The fact that he was taken down on the journey in a, 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 a nice smelling thing, that's some sort of comfort to you. Uh, I hate to use this marshal, but it just popped into my head. If they were taking Jews um, on cattle wagons, but they weren't cattle wagons, they had to use the cattle, but somehow they'd been used to bring 
to to take, to take uh, sweet smelling spices or perfumes, uh, and the cattle wagons were taking the juice to Auschwitz. Would it be a big comfort to them that uh, on their road to oblivion, physical oblivion, uh, and and yours is to spiritual oblivion, uh, that is a comfort. Um, what difference is it made to him given what's happening to him in his life? It's, it's nice smelling two day journey, two day journey down to Egypt, or uh, one that smells not so nice. Vicky Rech shall be some in Bel Issa Shaw, Mora Yochel, a hoil loyum, a mash. Is that going to make any difference? A Yochel, a has of his caress roch. That's going to cure his the, the situation he's in. However, it says, if you think very deeply, there's a big difference. There's a big thing going on here. Because a time when he could become uh, depressed, that he could despair, that his amuna, his whole life view, would be challenged and maybe even has shalom destroyed. The fact that this happened was a wink, Mina Shemayim, was a little smile from heaven to let him know that you're going down to Mitzrayim, I'll go down with you. Hashem, I'm with you on the way. And of course, we know that when Yaakov goes down to Mitzrayim, Hashem goes down as well. In fact, to continue the Holocaust analogy again, where the question, where was God in Auschwitz? The answer is God was in Auschwitz with the Jewish people. Obviously, that's a much bigger topic than uh, I want to start. It's a thread I don't want to pull on. Anyway, but any, not now, anyway. Uh, to let him know, I've not forgotten you. Uh, no, he's putting his hand in Yosef's hand and saying, I'm coming down with you to Mitzrayim. The same sort of idea. And then he gives two other examples. Um, David Melech, when he goes out to fight uh, Goliath, now how tall is Goliath? Uh, Goliath is 22 feet tall. So I'm six feet. So three knees would be 18. So basically um, three and a half knees. He's a very, very tall individual, to put it mildly. David Amelik hits him with the stone, hits him in the head. So that, of course, what, and this is the big question. Uh, when the Goliath falls, as it says in Shmuel, he falls in his face. Boom. Now, if somebody was to punch you or you were to hit, been hit hard in the head, you would fall backwards. But he fell forward. Why did he fall forward? Why did Hashem, as the Medrash say, says, change the normal gravitational pull of the earth to pull him backwards so that he fell forwards? So listen to this one. In order that Dov the Melech was going to cut up his head to display to the uh, Philistine army and therefore demoralize them <coughs> and guarantee, excuse me, <coughs> and guarantee that they lose the war, so that he didn't have to walk. So if he, if he falls backwards, so David Amalek in front of him, he's going to have to walk 22 feet in order to cut off the guy's head. But if he falls forward, boop, he falls at David Amalek's feet and just has to bend, bend down and cut off the guy's head. Um, so is it such a big deal that he would have to walk 22 feet? Hmm. But it's a little wink, another little wink, Mina Shemaim, a little letting you know that you're there. Go back to the Ramban. From the big miracles in Mitzrayim, it points to the small miracles that are with us all the time. Bezei, you saw it call it Kula. And that's the fundamental of all the Torah. Avram Avinam. When Hashem says to Avram Avinam, I'm going to show you the land that your children are going to inherit. And, and from the what place you're standing, north, south, east, and west. And the Medrash says, a miracle happened. North, south, east, and west. You would picture that, that he looked to the north and then he turned around to the south, or rather he would turn around and look to the east and then to the south and turn around and look to the west. No, he saw it all without turning his head, without having to turn his head. A little miracle. What, why is that such a necessary thing? Does it make a big difference? Yeah, it, it's an endorsement from Shem. It's another wink, Mina Shemaim. No. Now Rukhaim Shmulevitz goes a marshal. Incidentally, Rukhaim Shmulevitz and marshals are beautiful. They're wonderful. And the marshal goes like this. 
Incidentally, if you want to see this, in case you've got sickles muster at home, it's a bit page of Samach Zion, and it's called Nes, um, Nes Pach Hashem. Okay, so he says, imagine there's a family and a diamond gets lost. In fact, my, my wife lost her um, engagement ring. Um, it dropped on the floor and simply disappeared. And we, we found it and managed to get somehow or other behind the, um, the cabinets of the uh, underneath the sink. I don't know how we did it. Uh, but we found it. But so imagine a family and a diamond has been lost, maybe a diamond ring. So everybody is scuttling about trying to find this diamond ring. And a little boy, a little boy comes and a little boy uh, of the family finds the diamond ring. Well, there's a simcha that affects everyone. But then the little boy's father takes it and gives him a kiss. There is the simcha for the whole family. This valuable diamond ring has been found and a special kiss for him. It's a beautiful idea. And that's the idea, says Rukhan Shmulevitz, about this contradiction or contrast we have between the two reasons, the two miracles that could have been uh, the miracles that we celebrate at, at Hanukkah. Alan Nisim focuses on the, the big one, the miracle that affected all the Jewish people, the defeat of a, of a Greek army, the reestablishment of the base of Mikdash, etc. Fantastic, incredible, mighty men, huge warriors defeated by people who weren't. That's the big thing. But then there's a little thing, a little thing, a wink. Uh, in fact, he says that the miracle that was necessary in order to save the Jewish people from spiritual extermination, that was the war. That was a miracle that we were talking about before in the Rambam about there are rules that, the, that Moshe Rabbeinah sets out to define and describe what a miracle is that we have to take it seriously, we have to pay attention to it. But Rukhan Shalev says that that, very, that gives a very nice insight into miracles. A different, I think it's his own Kiddush, his own novel uh, uh, approach, but I think it's fabulous. And that is to say that the, the big miracle, in a sense, God had to do the big miracle. Of course, we had to generate the merit, we had to generate the, as being worthy of the miracle, but the miracle was therefore necessary because he promised Abraham Levine he'd never forget, forget or wipe out his connection to the Jewish people. The Jewish people would never be wiped out either. So that's going to perforce demand he does the big miracle. And, but that's the simcha that comes afterwards, the big miracle, the finding of the diamond. The kiss, as he calls it, the nashika, the kiss of Hashem on the head of the little child who finds it, that's the, a little bit further, a little bit more, a wink, Mina Shemaim. It takes it, there's the simcha, there's the big thing, then it's just a stage beyond that. And sometimes you, you get that as well. Remember, from the big miracles, there's points the little miracles, which is almost a personal endorsement, a little wink to you. Um, and of course, the fact it was the the, the, the Kohenim, the Hashmanaim, or Kohenim, who... Uh, uh, created the whole thing. It makes sense. A little wink went to them uh, for uh, uh, that their their role in the base of Mikdash would be reestablished. The lighting on the menorah. That's that was that that, that was the little wink. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And I want to tell it story. And it's a story, as I said, that uh, is in the news uh, in the last three days. Muhammad Abu Jala Masud. Uh, now an old man, a Libyan and is now been um, captured by um, American forces, is now in the United States, in federal prison somewhere. The man who designed and built, or is alleged, I should say, to have designed and built the bomb that blew up Pan Am Flight 103 in 1988 on the 21st of December, just after Hanukkah, by the way, um, uh, resulting in the death of uh, 243 passengers on the aircraft, on the, on, the, on the plane, 16 crew and 11 people on the ground below in the town of Lockerbie in Scotland, my home country. The story uh, was that the flight originated in Frankfurt. It flew from Frankfurt in Germany to London, um, where it took on new passengers in preparation from the flight from London, when it now became Pan Am from London to New York. Um, and from New York, it was supposed to be flying on to Detroit. And that would be the end of that, of that, uh, uh, it's, it's sojourn. 
When it landed in London, uh, terrorists somehow managed to get on board a smuggle on board in, in somebody's luggage, a cassette recorder, which was actually a bomb. The allegation is that this fellow, uh, Mohammed uh, Ab Abajela um, Masood, was the designer of that bomb. And the plane, um, if you can picture in your mind a map of the UK, London, of course, in the, is in the southeast. The plane flies up of the curvature of the earth is going to fly up north over the Atlantic to get to, and then come down again to get to New York. It usually takes seven and a half hours. That meant it was going to cross over the border between England and Scotland. And when it did so, uh, just a few 20 miles or so across the border, it crossed over uh, the town, uh, it came over the town of Lockerbie. And that's when the bomb blew up, resulting in, as I said, 243 pass uh, passengers being killed. 16 uh, crew and 11 people on the ground who were killed by frying pieces of the plane uh, falling on their houses, killing them or setting fire to their houses. And that's the, that's the story. And I say it, it's come to life again, ironically, now this is just before Hanukkah, and that incident just happened just after Hanukkah. Uh, and when this happened, uh, I was living in Manchester, and when I heard this in the radio, um, I wanted to see the news and Obviously, when it's something that happens in your hometown, you are, or your home country, you're interested to see what's what's going on. So I had a, a relative who lived around the corner, um, and it was called Uncle Morris, who was a German Jew, who managed to get out just ahead of the, of the Nazis. And he had a TV. So I went around to his apartment, and I was watching the evening news and seeing you know, all the footage of the burning wreckage, etc. And the reports were uh, terrifying. And the next day I went back in the morning to see as the story was developing, and of course, the enormity of the, the crime and the largest uh, terror attack in the UK to date um, uh, was being fully developed. The story was being fully explained. And I'm back in the evening um, to see again what was happening. I was watching it with Uncle Morris on his TV set. When the phone rang, his landline rang, and he picked up the phone, and he turned to me in his German accent, and he said, it's for you. And so he passed the phone to me, and I took the phone, and it was one of my dearest uh, friends, somebody called Shlomo Adler. Shlomo Adler is now sadly been Nifter. Shlomo Adler was, for many years, the head of the Hebrick edition, the, what's that called, the Hebrew Burial Society, you know, the people, these great Sadikim, who look after dead bodies, who wash the dead bodies as Jewish law demands, who gets them ready for their burial, etc. Uh, it's very holy work, Chavra Kedisha. And he was in charge of the Chavra Kedisha. And he was phoning me from Lockerbie. I think this was the song, that's right, the night after. Now, if you can picture a map of, England, of the UK in your, in, in your mind, just in the northeast of England is the, the Jewish community of Gateshead. And Gateshead is, has its own Chavra Kedisha went rushing over because reports soon came in there were Jews on the flight, I think 34, maybe 36, I can't remember. And of course, these dead Jewish bodies needed to be attended to. When they arrived in Lockerbie, um, Orthodox Jews, the big black hats, the Scottish police who'd probably never seen anything quite like it, uh, hadn't a clue how to deal with this and just said, no, you're not getting in uh, to deal with these bodies. And that's when Shulma Adler and the Manchester Clever Kadisha arrived. Now, the Manchester Clever Kadisha were different to the Gateshead Clever Kadisha in one respect. The Gateshead Clever Kadisha were all rabbis. So when they were told, no, they sort of like were stuck. But the Manchester Chavra Kedisha were all businessmen, or mostly businessmen, and businessmen know that you don't take no for an answer. And this was Shlomo Adler phoning me because he wasn't taking no for an answer. So he phoned me up and he said, Yehuda Yoyna, uh, that's my name, by the way, in case you wonder what YY stands for. Um, he said, I'm at Lockerbie. We need to get in to um, do the Taras and the, the Jews were killed in the in, in, on the flight, the Pan Am flight, I need to have the phone number of the Secretary of State for Scotland. Now, in those days, before Scotland um, uh, got its own parliament again, then it, uh, the uh, Margaret Thatcher was the prime minister. In her cabinet, somebody, one person was given the role of um, the Secretary of State for Scotland. In those days, it was Sir Malcolm Rifkind. And Sir Malcolm Rifkind was a cousin of my late wife's. Um, and we'd actually just been together two weeks before at a family uh, 
Burmits, if I remember rightly, in Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. And so he phoned up and he said he needs to speak to Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Sir Malcolm Rifkin, as the Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, was in charge of the police amongst, well, he was the, like the Prime Minister of Scotland, he was in charge of everything, but particularly in charge of the police. And therefore, if he phoned them up and said, let these rabbis in, let these Hebra Kadisha guys in, they would. I said, look, I can't give you that phone number. Um, it's like having the phone number of the President of the United States of America or the Queen or something, or the King, I should say, um, of England. You just can't give it out. I said, however, I'll phone him up and I'll try and get him to phone you. And now, in 1988, if you can remember, I don't know if you do remember, um, what cell phones looked like. Do you remember them? They looked like bricks. And his business was cell phones. In those days, they, were, they weren't sold by the, the companies like Apple. Um, they, were own, they were sold in their own right, Nokia, etc. Uh, and he, that was his business originally. So I, he, he said, I've only got a few minutes left of battery time. Uh, if you remember, the battery lasted for only an hour, obviously made by Apple. Anyway, so basically I said, okay, I'll try my best. So I phoned up to Malcolm Rifkin's house in Edinburgh and his wife answered the phone. And it was all extremely nice, also sort of uh, nice, uh, friendly, fa familial uh, greetings and uh, and uh, conversation. But very soon, and my tone of voice changed, I said, I need to speak to Malcolm. And his wife, wonderful lady, by the way, sadly passed away, uh, re recognized the tone of urgency in my voice and realized this was now becoming an official phone call. And she went into wife of secretary of state mode and said, what's it about? And I told her what it was about. And she said, well, have you gone through the regular channels? And I said, the regular channels seem to be blocked. And she said, well, Malcolm has just come back from Lockerbie, he's seen such horrible sights, that I don't think he'll ever get them out of his mind. Um, I don't know if he'll be able to speak to you on the phone. He's very distressed. And I said, I understand, but please, we could ask him. After all, we are, and then I used that magic Hebrew word, mishpocha, mishpacha, family. She said, hold on. And she went, there was quite a delay, and then eventually Malcolm came to the phone, and in his accent, Lovely fellow, by the way. And now, Yehuda Yoinan. Um, I think it was Waiwai, actually, said. Waiwai. Do you really think after a body has fallen 35,000 feet um, at 350 miles an hour, was anything left for the for the Hever Kadisha to do to her too? Which is a pretty ugh, horrible thing to conceive, a concede, uh, to, sorry, to conceive. Um, and so um, I said, Malcolm, I hear what you, he's always, oh, I've just come back from Lockerbie and I've seen such terrible sights and et cetera. So I said, Malcolm, I hear what you're saying, but please phone this number for me, family, Mishpocha. And he did. And he got to speak to Shlomo Adler and the police let them in. And they found a remarkable thing. And as I say, there was 243 um passengers and 16 crew but and the damage was terrible the damage to the bodies was absolutely awful now i'm going to illustrate this so if you're squeamish this would be a good moment to press the mute button for a few things and i'll give you a thumb up when the gory stuff is finished but basically uh Shlomo adler himself told, uh, told me he wasn't able to sleep for an entire year after this process because the town hall had been made into a, a makeshift mortuary there was garbage bags, bags full of heads, legs, and eyeballs, and other body parts. And I won't even go into it, even having given that uh, warning in too much detail. But you can imagine it was as gory and horrible as you can imagine. Thumbs up for those who've not been, who uh, want to switch the sound back on again. So there was horrible sights to see there. But here's the thing. Of the 34 or 36 Jews who were on that flight, not one Jew had more than a thing, as much as a fingernail missing. Not one Jew had as much as a fingernail missing. In most cases, the maximum damage to any of the bodies was bruising, and sometimes not even that. Um, Shalma Adler told me when families arrived from America, because most of the Jews in the flight were American Jews, um, they were able to collect, uh, collect the bodies and to see the bodies. In most cases, he, he told me, it was hard to know why this person was dead. Another interesting thing was that the Jews, all of the Jews, were um, clothed. When you're flying 
um, through the air at 350 miles an hour, you the 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 speed of the air, um, are you flying through the air? The air tears your clothes off. The bodies are found naked on the ground, but every Jew, well, their their basic dignity was protected. They may have been down to their underwear, but their basic dignity was was protected. Um, remarkable. Anyway, that was the story. Uh, a month after that, I was saying the story in a shear at a Shabbaton run by Orsebeach in Wales. And a month after that, I was in London walking along Golders Green Road. And when I was walking along Golders Green Road, a young lady came up to me, about 30, and she said, Robert Rudson, can I, can I speak to you? I said, of course. She said, you told this story a month ago I heard in Wales. I said, yes. She said, is it true? And I said, yes, it's true. She said, because I told it to my parents and it gave them a lot of, a lot of comfort because um, my brother was on the flight. So as I remember the story, it goes like this. The brother was not uh, a, a very religious Jew. He was somebody who always, when he traveled, he was a very nervous traveler, um, would carry his tefillin with him, not for wearing, but for a mazel, for good luck. Um, and he was coming to New York. And he always carried his tefillin, uh, as I say, for good luck. Now, where, where do you think? Oh, he was on the flight. Um, when they found his body, which was four days after the, the explosion, they found him in a forest in the fetal position. He was still wearing his underwear. And tucked beside him, leaning against his, his, his tummy, was his tefillin back. Now, let's pause. Picture this. He's got the tefillin with him. And where do you think the tefillin were located? Maybe in the hold with his suitcase? Unlikely. Maybe in the overhead locker in his hand luggage? I would say very likely. Maybe indeed he was such a nervous traveler that he carried, or he held onto the tefillin bag the, the entire flight until of course the explosion. But it doesn't matter. Because the chances of, even if he's holding it, gr grasping it firmly in his, in his hands, if you're flying through the air, 35,000 feet, 350 miles an hour, or um, exact figures, I'm not sure, of the velocity, um, the chances of you being able to hold on to it is zero. It's going to be ripped out of your hands. And yet four days later, this poor boy was found dead on the ground in the fetal position and right beside him, literally leaning, leaning against his tummy, was his tefillin bag. Now, I don't know what the statistical chances are of such a thing happening. Uh, from the big miracles, we see the little miracles, but this, to my mind, is a big miracle. I just don't know how they all could burn for seven days, but it did. That's a big miracle, big-ish. But how it could be that all these Jews on this flight were intact? Oh, and certainly some non-Jewish people were also intact, but all the Jews were. Um, but mostly weren't. Um, and how it could be that this tefillin bag would, sit, it would, be, would fall and be beside him? Sometimes, even in these situations, and it must have been pretty dark uh, in Hanukkah before the war was won, um, there's a little smile that comes at the end, a little wink. And for me, being involved in that story was one of the most profound stories or events that ever happened in my life. I saw, or I felt I saw, but only Sekho should be called Yomi Mono, but Yomi Mahim Basman Azer. Maybe Yosef, in fact, Yosef felt the same thing. When he's going down to Mitzrayim, he doesn't question Hashem, it's Gamzu Latoiva. And he feels it a little bit more uh, when it's a nice smelling encampment. Uh, he's being transported to Egypt in. And Avram Avinu doesn't have to look to the left or the right with Dovid and Mela. It's, it's a little wink, the little kiss that, as it were, not just the major celebration, but a specific little kiss from Shemaim. And uh, it's a, a big deal when Hashem gives you a little kiss. I hope you have a wonderful Shabbos, and I hope you have a wonderful Hanukkah. I'll look forward to seeing you again next week.